Well, uh, we're very pleased to uh, to welcome you to uh, to this to this event. Um, there's a nice crowd here um, at the Watson Institute, and uh, I imagine uh, uh, people beginning to plug in overseas. And uh, we welcome you all, regardless of how you got here. Um, so, uh, so this is a talk sponsored by uh, the Center for Contemporary South Asia. Um, and uh, we have uh, two really great economists speaking to us today. Um, so Arvind uh, Subramanian is the Mira and Vikram Gandhi Fellow at uh, CCSA and a senior fellow of the Watson Institute. So uh, he's on the home team, which is fantastic. Uh, he was formerly professor at Ashoka University and the founding director of the Ashoka Center for Economic Policy. He was chief economic advisor to the government of India between uh, 2014 and 2018, and he has visited the Harvard Kennedy School, um, has brought interest in global development, global economic fi um, and, and financing, financial and trade system. Um, and he's author of uh, many publications and books. He's been involved in the early round of trade negotiations, involved with GATT and so forth. So uh, he's exactly the sort of person that we would uh, would want to tell us about what's going on in India. Um, and uh, how to make sense of uh, what's been happening. All right, go ahead. <coughs> good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, and of course, uh, good evening if you're elsewhere in the world. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, this talk, uh, the comments, and of course, the discussion with my uh, co-author and, and former colleague in government, Raghu, who's hopefully uh, joining us and listening to us online. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Josh Fellman, and of course it's benefited from discussions with you know too many people uh, to list, some of whom are listed here uh, nevertheless. Uh, this seems like a, a topical title, Is the Indian Economy Back? Um, because, you know, two years ago, as, as Ashu has kind of been saying on social media, uh, Raghuram Rajan gave a, a very important talk here uh, two years ago, uh, suggesting that the Indian economy was, in, uh, was not doing well. And then Josh Feldman and I wrote a piece uh, uh, soon after saying that the Indian economy was in the intensive care unit ICU. And that was before COVID hit uh, the Indian economy. Uh, so that's why, you know, if you contrast with that and say, is the Indian economy back, uh, it seems like something has changed, and it clearly something has. But the question is, have they fundamentally changed? And that's going to be uh, the talk of this uh, uh, lecture. So just a, a, a brief overview. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, markets being uh, uh, very optimistic about India, but a kind of clear sense of pessimism uh, more broadly. And I'm going to advance the hypothesis that uh, uh, India has, after three decades of very rapid growth and transformation, i.e. from the 1980s to the 2010s, has in the last uh, decade, the 2010s, suffered from what I would call aborted structural transformation, uh, a decade-long phenomenon. And I'm going to explain that uh, in the course of the lecture. Uh, therefore, uh, how do you get back? I think India needs to revive its two uh, engines of growth, the long-run engines, both labor-intensive exports with the emphasis very much on labor because there's a big employment uh, crisis in India, uh, and revive private investment. And I'm going to argue that, uh, to be fair to the government, it has a strategy for doing both. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's made impressive progress uh, in creating what I would call the hard hardware for economic development. But I think um, one has to be anxious about what I would call the software of policy making more broadly, which is defective, and I think which will kind of impede uh, real uh, progress going forward. Uh, I want to be clear that I have very little time. A whole host of macro short-term issues uh, I'm not going to touch. Uh, we can take them up uh, in, in the Q&A. So markets are optimistic. I mean, they're not just optimistic, they're giddy. Stock market in India is booming, not just because global liquidity is flush, even relative to uh, you know, emerging market and rich country stock markets, India has done exceptionally well. And you see the line, India line, uh, outpacing the others. And even as we speak two days ago, Moody's just 
upgraded India, uh, it's, it's not its rating, but its outlook from negative to stable. So there's a sense that, you know, things are happening. Um, FD, FDI is, is surging in India, you know, record levels, something like, you know, uh, five and a half billion every month. And you see it's been on a steady upward trend and picked up considerably uh, in the last few, uh, in the last couple of years. And then we have what is kind of one of the most exciting developments in India. It's documented by Credit Suisse uh, uh, economist Neelkant Mishra and uh, Ashish Gupta. So a combination of cheap finance, uh, entrepreneurial talent, India's software expertise, technological ability, plus the creation of a non-proprietary public uh, uh, digital platform has enabled the rise of these unicorns, basically companies which are close to one billion valuation uh, but have not yet been listed. So India has about 100 of them today, and uh, the combined valuation is something like, you know, three, four hundred billion. And what is distinctive is that it's all based on, you know, technology and, and digital stuff, uh, but the applications are, you know, spread out all over the economy. Retail, finance, education, food, cloud computing, logistics, tourism, hotels. So it's kind of like a digitech boom happening uh, in India today. Uh, I, I like to joke that India is adding unicorns uh, as rapidly as it's adding chess grandmasters. You know, India has about 70 chess grandmasters and about now 70 to 100 uh, unicorns as well. So the question is, why are markets optimistic? This, I mean, it's not just optimistic. There's a sense of a heady optimism in India. I think there are a number of short-term factors. Um, exports are coming back, thanks in part to the global boom. Um, India's fiscal revenues are very buoyant. There's, of course, the natural bounce back from COVID, which is very rapid, and people forget that it's just a bounce back. They look at the bounce, and they say the economy is coming back. That's contributing to it. And the possibility that the worst of COVID is over, uh, partly from a very high infection rates, 70 plus percent, plus the fact that now about 70 percent of India uh, is, has at least one vaccination shot. So the possibility that COVID, perhaps the worst, is behind us. Second, I think the optimism is based on a sense that the government has a very active reform agenda. And even as we speak today, uh, after 68 years in the public sector, uh, this iconic company, Totemic uh, Significance Air India, nationalized in 1953, was today actually privatized and given back to its original uh, private sector owner. So, so the sense that you know, privatization uh, is going to happen, combined with other plans like the government is plan planning to monetize a lot of assets, um, it's unleashed kind of India's version of industrial policy via these production subsidies to boost exports and a whole slew of reforms, including labor market reforms. And whatever you, you and I may think of the, the content, it's hard to escape the fact that on the reform side, the government uh, does not suffer from underactivity. Hyperactivity characterizes the reform agenda. Um, so markets are optimistic short-term factors, active reform, progress in building hardware, which I spoke about. Now, this is really quite striking. On the left-hand side, you see the physical hardware, uh, road and rail uh, networks being added extremely rapidly. This is an eight-lane highway, Delhi, Mumbai, about to be completed. Four expressways in India's largest state, Uttar Pradesh. The Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir are being connected. So the sense that connectivity is increasing in India, which, by the way, partially also contributes to the unicorn, uh, bo uh, unicorn boom that I spoke about. Uh, similarly, on the railways, a freight corridor, a dedicated freight corridor is being uh, uh, finalized. Uh, and so, you know, infrastructure is kind of getting built at a very rapid pace. And on the other side, the digital uh, 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 infrastructure, uh, there's something called the Unified Payment Interface, which is a digital non-proprietary platform. And you see the numbers are staggering. You know, just to give you a sense, on the, the value number for 20, of April 21 is something like six trillion uh, rupees. You know, just one trillion is about 30 and a half billion dollars. <coughs> and you can see the rapid progress. A lesser uh, notice, but no less, even more important, 
part of the hardware is what I call the hardware of this government's new welfareism policy. Uh, this welfareism consists of providing to people essentially essential private goods and services uh, like you know, cooking gas, toilets, bank accounts, rural housing, electricity, uh, etc. Those which are tangible and which can be attributable to the government and the prime minister. Um, uh, so on the left hand side, stuff, essential goods and services are being given and the other tangible that's being given is, is direct transfers. And just look at the um, amounts there, for example, you know, the blue bar, uh, it's again, five and a half, six trillion dollars, almost hundred billion dollars of direct transfers every year to about one and a half billion beneficiaries. Now, th this hardware of new wel welfareism that others have also written about, Niranjan Sarkar and Yamini Ayer, is absolutely the bedrock of the political success of the prime minister and this government. You know, I'm not an expert on politics. Ashu does, uh, knows much better. But you know, whatever else might be happening, but this provision of the hardware of the new welfareism is, is part of the success, part of the achievement. Uh, some of the things overstated, some we don't know whether there'll be follow up, but it's undeniable that a lot has taken place. And of course, uh, the latest hard, I mean, um, essential good and services that's going to be added to this list is uh, piped water into every household. Already since 2019, 50 million households, rural households have got piped water, uh, and that's going to be a, uh, followed up further. So, so that's the reason why markets are optimistic. And of course, finally, the sense that the banking and corporate sector, which has been weak for two, uh, for, for almost a decade, what I used to call the twin balance sheet problem, there's a sense that it's finally being uh, addressed. But then you have the paradox, why are Indians so pessimistic? This is the RBI Consumer Confidence Survey, and it asks, you know, are you, opt are, are, are you optimistic? Has the situation improved? And you see both in level and change, things have never been worse according to the Consumer Confidence Survey. About 75 to 80% of Indians think who are surveyed think that the situation has deteriorated relative to improved. Uh, so, so this is a puzzle. And again, I get the sense that this discontent is also manifest in politics. Uh, tensions between the center and the states over sharing of fiscal resources. The revival of the politics of what in India we call reservations, affirmative action. Uh, and as Pratap Banumetha has pointed out, this wave of the revival of the politics is quite different from the previous big wave in 1989 when the Mandal Commission report came out, because that was to expand the reservation pie, the affirmative action pie. Today it's about a fixed pie and jockeying for position to get more of that fixed pie. Um, numerous states in alarmingly are enacting jobs for locals, like you know, India's no longer, you know, the, the, the possibility it may not be an integrated labor market, a lot of disaffection in agriculture. And my sense is that you know, one shouldn't be reductive about Indian politics, but all this discontent stems from kind of the loss of economic dynamism, a sense of zero sumness, a sense that you know, had the pie been expanding rapidly, it's doubtful whether we'd have seen all this discontent and this uh, jockeying for this fixed pie. So here's my um, <clears throat> hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that there's been a aborted structural transformation uh, for 10 years. Uh, the 2010s basically have been not a lost decade, but a decade of disappointment, the 2010s. Now, uh, just to be clear, because uh, you know, Indian economists uh, are get into trouble for this, uh, one should be careful, this is not a post-2019 phenomenon. It is not a post-this government phenomenon. It is a post-global financial crisis phenomenon in which at least two governments are, are complicit. Uh, and, I'll, you know, and there is this tendency I I analyzing the Indian economy uh, to see more disruption than continuity. And I'm going to argue that there's a lot of continuity in addition to the disruption and the change that uh, you know, owes to this government. And I will talk about that, but we shouldn't lose underlying sense of continuity. Um, the growth dynamism has ebbed for about 10 years. And this is where I think my new research has made me uh, kind of alerted me to this kind of a, 
a, a eureka moment, that it's not just that the growth dynamism has ebbed, that along many development dimensions, the Indian economy has stalled or even gone backward. And I would like all of us to, at least I would urge, that we resist seeing this as a kind of a rich, poor, middle class, upper class kind of uh, divide and kind of bring in the inequality perspective, although there is a lot of that, because I'm going to argue that it's much more broad uh, based and it's a kind of aborted structural transformation uh, in the broadest sense. Um, the slowing growth, you see the white bar is what the growth was before uh, uh, 2011. The red bar after 2011, these are annual average rates of growth in these major macro indicators of the economy. Uh, they basically collapsed after 2011. And, uh, you know, I've been saying this for a long time, not completely successfully, but the new data point has been added, the last two lines. We have this new All India Debt and Investment Survey, and what you find is that the same pattern in asset growth, you know, before very rapid asset growth, afterwards even negative uh, asset growth or, or, or virtually no growth at all. So, so the story that after 2011, the you know, dynamism uh, ebbed out of the Indian economy, in my view, is incontrovertible. But then there's the broader stuff. And, and here, remember, I'm still talking pre-COVID. Secular decline in employment, as you can see, the, um, this is from CMIE data. Um, Premature, Danny Roderick's premature deindustrialization, which uh, we spelt out for India, the share of manufacturing in the workforce already low, uh, you know, 12, 13% has come down to, you know, about 8% uh, in the space of five years. And progress in child health, in, uh, India was making significant progress, and you see these are indicators of stunting, anemia, diarrhea, acute respiratory illness, um, up means, uh, 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 improvement because the scales are inverted, a uh, bad is inverted, and you see, for example, stunting basically has flattened out in the last five, six years. Uh, and, and so this is kind of part of this uh, aborted structural transformation. A and this is just as an aside, uh, you know, we've, I've just shown you the dis digital boom, but cash is back even after demonetization with a vengeance. So cash to GDP is about three, four percentage points higher than after demonetization when one of the objectives was to actually reduce uh, the cash in the economy. So then we fast forward to COVID, a human uh, and health tragedy, infection rates about 70 percent, uh, excess deaths per capita, it's clear that about it's kind of below average in the G20, and excess debt somewhere between two and a half and four and a half million. The economic uh, devastation, uh, I don't want to go into this chart, essentially to say that the level of per capita consumption now, depending on who you believe in terms of the numbers, is somewhere the level is either at the level of five years ago or 10 years ago, possibly. So, so the level of per capita consumption has been stagnant somewhere between five and 10 years. And undoubtedly, poverty has probably also gone up. Gone up uh, and the Azim Premji University estimates that num poverty has gone up actually quite significantly in the tens of millions, at least. Um, per capita GDP, again, now back to levels seen two or three years ago. Uh, and so COVID has kind of just compounded what was a secular weakness in the economy. Um, stunning re-ruralization due to COVID on the left-hand side, the share of employment in agriculture has gone up. And of course, the most devastating of all, COVID has uh, set back human capital formation in India significantly. You know, Rukmini Banerjee of Pratham, uh, Jean Dress and uh, Ritika Kera have done a school survey. And you see during COVID, 8% um, children studying online regularly, um, uh, you know, 60% don't meet their teachers. So it's just a, a kind of human uh, tragedy, uh, this uh, uh, loss of schooling for what, uh, one and a half years. Of course, this has been true all over the world, but the difference in India is that your initial level of educational outcomes are themselves so poor that to lose this is, I think, uh, something of a different order of magnitude. So the natural question, why did this uh, uh, tra transformation get aborted? 
remember to be uh, uh, fair and honest and clear, there was a global slowdown post global financial crisis. You know, the whole world economy slowed down, but India did slip differentially. You know, in the 20, in the aughties, the 2000s, India was the fastest growing economy in the world, faster than even China, depending upon uh, what time frame you looked at it. So India slipped more. And I would argue that, you know, many argue that happened because, you know, the, the pace of reform slowed down uh, after the late 90s, early 2000s. But I think, uh, as I said, most governments are, both governments are complicit. Uh, you know, the UPA government, macro mismanagement, you know, endemic rampant corruption, anti-investor action, decision-making paralysis. I, I think we tend to forget uh, uh, those days when you know the Indian economy was in a real funk uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, and so uh, you know the origins of this, uh, uh, at least timing-wise, you know predate uh, 2014, and I think we should uh, take account of that. Of course, uh, after 2014, uh, the factors included, you know, the disruptions from demonetization, COVID, GST, and and, and Raghu made the point in his lecture. Uh, uh, two years ago, that uh, one of the big reasons, and I, I don't want to reduce his rich analysis to one or two things, but I think one central idea was the centralization of decision-making authority under this government, which led to, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, not very good policy design and implementation. Uh, I'm going to come back to that thought in just a second. I think, above all, um, the twin balance sheet challenge from the excesses of the uh, of the, uh, of the 2000s were basically not addressed for 10 years and i would like to put forward the hypothesis here that you know while ragu's point very very valid i think it's one aspect of a bigger deficiency in this government's policy making which i'm going to call the software of policy making I'm just going to come back to that. So, 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 the, so the deficiency is much bigger than just centralization. Uh, what do I mean by the twin balance sheet challenge? You know, for 10 years, basically in the 2000s, all this infrastructure got built. Uh, what happened was uh, 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 many of the firms became indebted. On the left-hand side, you see you know, about 40% of firms had debt uh, and, uh, uh, which of 40% of the total debt of the economy was with companies who could barely meet their interest payments. And on the counterpart, the counterpart of that on the right-hand side was the, the banking system, because this was one of those unusual things in India where the boom of the 2000s was not financed by bond markets, not financed by development uh, banking institutions, but financed by basically by public sector banks. So uh, the, the, the counterpart of the left-hand side chart are bad assets in the banking system. And, and so both firms were weak, bank were weak, therefore the supply of credit and investment in the economy, which I showed you earlier, for 10 years were basically uh, non-existent. Now, I, I want to elaborate on this, uh, uh, what I think is really the big problem of software in the last few years. Um, it's, you know, when I say software, uh, you know, uh, 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 economists, social scientists are going to call this by various names, institutions, uh, et cetera, you know, governance, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give it a bit more flesh, uh, data integrity and access seriously compromised in India over the last five years. GDP data, uh, consumption data withheld, not released. Employment data not released, withheld for a long time. Uh, COVID, during COVID, health data were also difficult to come by. Of course, fiscal data have become more transparent, and that we have to grant. But basically, th the foundation for policy making was uh, a, a bit iffy. Uh, then, second, uh, you know, what we would call fair decisions. Um, I, I think the sense that the government and regulators were not uh, uh, kind of fair between players, and, and I'm going to come back to this and elaborate on this theme, which I'm going to call stigmatized capitalism in India. The 2A variant, just as we have the Delta variant for COVID, this is the 2A variant. The 2A is referring to the two biggest uh, business groups in India. Uh, uh, they, they will not be named hereafter, <laughs> but, 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 uh, 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 but this will be, uh, and I'm going to uh, talk about these two groups. Statecraft, you know, just trust uh, with this, uh, with the, between the center and the states, inclusive decision making. This is part of what Raghu was alluding to uh, earlier. Rule of law, you know, the arbitrary tax enforcement, institutional erosion, arrears to suppliers, 
and of course policy uh, inconsistency. On the one hand, government enacts agricultural reforms uh, to free up the market, but at the first sight of scarcity, we impose stock controls and export restrictions, which kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, do bad. We don't do good to the farmers. India introduced one of the major achievements of this government was to introduce a bankruptcy code in 2016, but today it now lies in limbo. My favorite example, uh, uh, kind of something that really pains me of the policy inconsistency, is India's tax to GDP ratio has basically been flat for the last 10 years. And you see this chart it, uh, is that, you know, the exemption limits on personal income tax is the red, per capita GDP below. So essentially what you want is that you want more and more taxpayers to come into the system through organic growth. You know, incomes grow up, you have a fixed tax exemption limit, and more and more taxpayers come in. And what we find in India is that tax exemption limits have been raised much faster so that you're capturing fewer and fewer into the tax net. And in 2019, uh, you know, there's a red line up there. The, in 2014, the tax exemption limit was, you know, uh, 250,000, 2.5 lakhs. It was doubled to 2019. In one stroke, 75% of income taxpayers dropped out of the tax net. So, so these are all examples of, you know, policy inconsistency, the data, the rule of law, the, 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 the lack of inclusive decision making. Uh, and some of these have been pretty serious uh, and very important, uh, undermining some of the achievements. So the assessment broadly is that the economy is out of intensive care unit. But, you know, there's this whole uh, aborted structural transformation. So the starting point actually after 10 years of this is pretty, pretty uh, uh, stark. Uh, and so the government needs to revive uh, employment, exports and investment. So the key question is, will the government's strategies uh, succeed? Um, <clears throat> So let's take to these two you know, important uh, uh, objectives of the government to revive exports and investment, and then see what the strategy is in each of these uh, dimensions to evaluate you know, whether it's going to be successful or, or not. So uh, uh, the term that's used in India to describe broadly this strategy is called Atmanirbharta, which means self-reliance. Uh, 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 and, you know, I'm trying to put structure into this. I mean, it's not been articulated as such, but I think it, it's a three-pronged strategy. One, uh, what is new is uh, the new version of industrial policy, which is performance-linked production subsidies to uh, firms in 12 to 13 sectors. I'm just going to show those sectors. Second, uh, reversing a 25-year-old consensus that the economy would steadily open up you know, uh, in trade terms, that's been re reversed and India has gone back to uh, erecting trade barriers. And then the third component is India has consciously decided to stay out of some very key regional trade agreements. So this is kind of the broad strategy, you know, subsidies, protection, and you stay out of the international trade architecture. So what does one make of this? Uh, Shankar Acharya, um, one of my illustrious, our illustrious predecessors, chief economic advisor, has a very nice piece on these production-linked incentives. And his point is that, you know, look, I think first of all, one has to be open to whether this might work or not. Because certainly, I've seen some evidence for the cell phone sector that exports have increased to some extent because of these subsidies. So I think one should keep an open mind on it. But I think one has to nevertheless, uh, our default position should be to be a bit anxious. Because as Shankaracharya says, you know, it has all the makings of the pathologies of the old license uh, Raj, you know. Uh, arbitrary targets, can you be able to monitor the proliferation of, you know, uh, agencies implementing it, how are you going to monitor this? So, so it creates all these kinds of um, uh, complications which uh, could really uh, kind of uh, confound uh, policies. Second, what is striking about this, and you'll see this, there are 13 sectors listed here, except for one or two, they're mostly tech-intensive, capital-intensive sectors. If aborted structural transformation is, is about, you know, employment also not doing very well and labor intensive not doing very well, 
I think this is going to be, uh, this is kind of a misguided allocation of uh, scarce fiscal resources. And of course, one has to worry about exit. I mean, you know, after all, we, we always, uh, the infant industry argument was always about temporary protection. It stayed on for 30, 40 years, got intensified. You know, in India, reservations, affirmative action was meant to be, you know, uh, for 10 years. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it's, it's not only uh, remained, it's kind of proliferated and spawned and spread. And so you have to worry about the same things. Protectionism, I think this is really uh, uh, worrying. We know that an import tax is an export tax. Shomitro Chatterjee and I, on the left-hand side, we've shown that uh, India has increased tariffs to about 3,200 line items. Uh, average tariffs have gone up by five percentage points, and they now affect $300 billion or 70% of India's imports. So it's a huge reversal. I mean, mercifully, we've not gone back to 50, 60% tariffs, but it's still quite significant. And on the right-hand side is what I call a kind of, uh, a, a, kind of a, a killer indictment of Indian development strategy over the last 40 years. Uh, on the horizontal axis is a share of a country in the working age, global working age population. On the y-axis, share of that country in global exports. So if you broadly think that your labor endowment should be like your you know, labor intensive exports, you see India is about 15 percentage points uh, of that uh, on, on, the, on the wrong side, and China is 20 percentage points on, on the super right side. So this failure of Indian development policy, you know, although exports broadly may have done well, labor in intensive exports have seriously underperformed. This kind of reversal of protectionism is not going to help that uh, a labor intensive export strategy. Uh, <clears throat> staying out of trade agreements, you know, obviously geopolitics is very important. The China dimension is very important. Uh, and so I don't want to second guess the decision itself, but there are clear implications. You know, you're staying out of the world's most dynamic markets. RCEP is, you know, has, you know, China um, and, and all the dynamic Asian economies. Um, you're excluded from the world's most dynamic markets. You're excluded from supply chains uh, providing these goods. And one kind of sign of that exclusion is that, you know, uh, Shomitro and I calculate that since uh, the global financial crisis, China has vacated export space of about $150 billion, i.e. because as its wages have risen, it's become less competitive. So things like textiles, clothing, leather, footwear, etc., it has uh, lost market share. And India has at best gained 15% of that export space vacated by China. So if you stay out of the most dynamic parts of the world, what is the possibility of actually grabbing that export space is, of course, uh, seems very uh, uh, depressing. And of course, meanwhile, China has made a bid to become part of the bigger, you know, in, in size uh, um, Asia Pacific uh, trade agreement, which of course doesn't have the US, but everyone else. So if, if China is going to be you know, part of even bigger and India is going to be left out. So you see that, so when you step back and analyze this export strategy, you know, protectionism, import taxes and export tax doesn't help your labor intensive exports. Industrial policy, you know, maybe, maybe not a lot of risks uh, going back to the past and staying out of uh, dynamic markets and dynamic supply chains. It's, it's hard to be convinced that this trade strategy is going to work. Investment, what is the strategy? Uh, to be fair to the government, it's been active, hyperactive in this area. It's created a bad bank to address the twin balance sheet challenge. It's something that uh, you know, uh, I, I had called for amongst many others uh, when we were in government, both Raghu and I were in government. So uh, I would like Raghu to kind of uh, speak to this much more. Uh, uh, he knows more about this than I do. Uh, the government at the same time has taken a lot of actions to improve the investment climate. R R India enacted this a horrendous retroactive taxation under the previous government uh, 10 years ago under Pranab Mukherjee. Finally, reluctantly, a lot related to external pressure, this government reversed it. So I think it does get, get credit for that. Uh, uh, the telecom sector was in, in, in deep trouble. The government has taken action to kind of uh, create some breathing space in that sector. Uh, new reforms have been enacted. And I think this is a new and distinctive part 
of the investment strategy, uh, uh, promoting national champions, uh, the 2A variant of stigmatized capitalism I'm going to talk about. So the question is, will this strategy work? Um, <clears throat> You know, reviving private investment, uh, let's be honest, is going to be very difficult. On the left-hand side, you see new project announcements on a steady decline for 10 years, 15 years. Capacity utilization is very low. So even if you people wanted to invest, they would say, well, there's a lot of capacity. Let's first use up before we come back. It's going to be difficult. Uh, but, you know, uh, has the twin balance sheet problem gone away? Um, I would say that, you know, some progress has been made on the firm side. There's been a lot of resolution of bad uh, assets, but the weak indebted firms still account for one third of debt. Profits uh, are still not very high, not enough to sustain the investment. And I think there is the kind of, uh, uh, and Raghu is going to talk about hopefully more on this, the small and medium enterprise sector has been devastated by COVID. We still haven't seen the impact uh, in terms of the indebtedness and, and on the banking system. So I think this is a, a, a work in progress. Similarly, I think that non-performing assets on the bank side have come down, but it's still at 10%, probably higher when the SME issue drops and significantly higher in the public sector banks. And certainly there's no reason to believe that fundamental governance in the public sector banks has improved. So if you think about it, if you think the supply of credit has to come back and, and uh, uh, the willingness of investors to invest has to come back, it's still kind of, you know, one can't get overexcited about this. Yes, there's been some progress, but um, a lot left to go. Uh, you see the profits on the left-hand side post-COVID, it's come up a bit. Uh, well below the levels of the 2000s. And on the right-hand side, you see, again, the NPAs have come down from a peak of about 15 and a half now to 10%, but the SME shoe, uh, shoe is still waiting to drop, and the levels are still very high. Bad bank, I'm going to leave this to, uh, to, to Raghu, if, if you think, so, whether it's going to work or not. Uh, um, I have open questions. Uh, of course, in this, there's also, you know, uh, the government first enacted the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, but now it, it, there is another mechanism, so uh, it's kind of, we have to wait and see. So this is kind of a really new and distinctive aspect about Indian investment strategy. The two A stigmatized, you know, stigmatized capitalism in India is essentially the lurking sense that for the last 30, 40 years, private capital has flourished in part because of its proximity to government and of getting favors from government. The Indian IT boom was the first real sense that people got that this was globally competitive, it was distant from government, corporate governance was very good at these places, but everything else, there's always the stigma attached uh, to private sector performance. But this has taken a different turn now, which I call the 2A variant, uh, you know, promoting uh, a few uh, champions, in, in this case two, uh, like the Chai Ball and, and Zaibatsu. And I think one has to, again, be fair. The goals, after all, um, like the Chai Balls, they can become efficient, uh, they can grow to scale, they can exploit increasing returns, network externalities, and in the process there may be spillovers to the wider economy as well. But here's the thing, I, I'm not a historian, but in the history of global capitalism, in the history of global capitalism, the robber baronades, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the chai balls, the zaibatsus, has there ever been uh, 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 an instance when one or two firms have had such reach in the economy? So the two A's in India are uh, present in all these sectors, in some cases uh, with fairly high dominant market share petroleum, petrochemicals, textiles, telecoms. I mean, just reading the list makes you think, wow, this is, must be pretty unique in the history of uh, global capitalism. Again, um, and I don't know how many of you saw yesterday's uh, report, the Forbes Billionaire List of India. Uh, 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 this group added 50 billion to its uh, uh, valuation uh, 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 in, in one year, 50 billion. Uh, so his valuation went up from 25 billion to 75 billion uh, uh, in one year. And, and this is uh, quite interesting. Now, the question is that will this national champion strategy work? 
And here, I think that I, I think one has to be fair, as I said, you know, in the case of uh, Geo, it has revolutionized Indian uh, telecommunication sector. Uh, I think it has democratized uh, digital access because of lowering costs in a way that's been quite amazing. It's kind of the counterpart of uh, Dhirubhai Ambani uh, democratizing shareholder capital capitalism in India. So I think one has to be open that you know there is uh, efficiency here as well. But the reason for anxiety is that, you know, the chai bowls had to pass the export. You go through that list, most of them are in the non-tradable and regulated sectors. The chai bowls were a lot in tradable sectors, so they had to pass the global efficiency test. In this case, if you're in a non-traded sector, you're close to the powers that be, you, uh, regulatory favors are granted, you have to worry. So because you don't know whether it's, uh, these firms are fundamentally efficient or they're just profitable because they're being favored. I think, you know, I think one has to be open, but one has to be anxious. Now the followers, after all, you know, uh, the fact that uh, you know, so many people in India now own phones, uh, at cheap prices, I can access uh, the internet is, is hugely beneficial. The fact that uh, these two ways build infrastructure, huge spillovers as well. But I think one has to also worry about the effect on competition. You know, in India, there's this thing, the pati, patni, or wo. That is, you know, the, the wife has to deal with the husband, but then with the wo, it is the not to be named mistress. So the question is, what is happening in India? Do we have any evidence on uh, the impact of the two A's on competition. And there are some worrying uh, uh, examples already. In the telecommunication sector, it's no secret that uh, uh, the, uh, the other competitors to the uh, A have been, you know, kind of pretty, uh, have suffered uh, as a result of the regulatory favors. Similar regulatory favors done uh, in retail, which Amazon uh, uh, was uh, the victim of. Similar in platforms which others have, uh, have kind of uh, uh, been at the brunt of, borne the brunt of. And kind of my favorite example actually is in um, labor-intensive clothing. And, and this is something that people don't realize. If you want to boost labor-intensive garment exports from India, of course, a lot needs to be done. But if there's one thing that I would do, and uh, you know, forget the production subsidies are not going to help very much. If there's one thing that I would do, and all exporters of man-made garments would agree, is to reduce, look at that blue line, the tariff on man-made fibers in India. It's the highest amongst all the textile exporting countries, and recently it was increased. This is a tariff on man-made fiber that actually is there because one of the A's is manufacturers textiles. Uh, polyester text, uh, man-made fibers. And if, you know, uh, if one were to kind of get rid of this, which is not going to be easy, in fact, it's gone in the other direction, you know, the competition would, would benefit, or, or at least uh, <clears throat> people using that as downstream industries would benefit. So I think the adverse impact on competition is something that we should all be anxious about with this stigmatized capitalism uh, in India. Okay, I'm going to, uh, three slides left. Coming back to the long-term view on India, I think, and this is a point that uh, my friend Devesh Kapoor makes, India has made, the Indian state has made great strides in delivering hardware, infrastructure, physical, digital asset, and at scale over the last two decades across governments, starting with the uh, first NDA government under, Va under Vajpayee, which started the, you know, the rural roads and the other roads. Uh, and then you see whether it's the infrastructure, the direct benefit transfers, the employment guarantee scheme that the UPA started, the Food Security Act, the Goods and Services Tax, the Unified, all these are examples of hardware, you know, kind of provided by the state and at scale. You know, Billions, as I showed you, billions and trillions in terms of values and, and numbers. And, and as you can see, this example of roll and, road and rail, it's been a steady improvement. So in, in the kind of long-term view, I think the hardware uh, uh, is improving. But as I've emphasized before, you know, it's not enough to do that. One has to do all these other things. Otherwise, uh, you know, things get very difficult. And... I want to end, and this is one of my kind of favorite charts, and you know, all Indian audiences always like a China-India comparison. 
And so this is my uh, a favorite China India chart. So on the y axis is some measure of long run economic development. You know, you measure it how you want. And on the x axis is you know, what we would call institutions, governance, open politics, open economics, what I would call the software, both economic and political. And, and political. Uh, 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 by the way, uh, uh, in, in, when I said software, uh, I mean, of course, the elephant in the room in India is that it's not just economic software, but the political software of, you know, social harmony, inclusion, etc., very much have to be in any long run view of where the, even the Indian economy is going to do. So, on that, we know that uh, th this was like almost like, this was a, uh, my, uh, my kind of rejoinder to uh, Asimoglu and Robinson's Why Nations Fail, that you know, this long run causal relationship between kind of the software, economic, and political, and long run development, both China and India were outliers. China, at least at that time, uh, had you know, the, the political software uh, was, was given that it was overperforming. India, given its kind of openness, political openness, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, was significantly underperforming. Uh, and that's why one is below the line and one is above the line. We know that China under Xi, the, the red arrow is going unambiguously southwest, i.e., uh, China's hardware model is over. You, you know, this investment led model is now finished. We know for a number of reasons uh, housing, uh, infrastructure, ev everything is kind of a uh, thing. But, you know, what she is doing also in order to pursue other objectives is basically killing the entrepreneurial energy. Uh, on top of China's demographics, it's clear that the Xi turn is taking China southwards. The open question is India. You know, we know the hardware, as I've said, is improving, but you know, uh, the question of you know rule of law, inclusion, trust, uh, non-centralization of authority, uh, inconsist uh, consistency of policy, all these seem to be eroding. So, so the open question for India is, uh, you know, uh, is it going to go northeast in the right direction? or is it just going to tread water or maybe even go southeast? That's kind of uh, the open question for India going forward. So the imperative is to reverse this decade-long aborted structural transformation. This is the race. A and really, the future hinges on you know, whether uh, you know, the defective software can be uh, remedied or not. So, so I want to end by saying that, you know, is the Indian economy uh, back uh, in the short run? I think there are indicators, but for the long run, one should be somewhere between cautious and anxious about the future of the Indian economy. Well, thank you very much for those uh, stimulating thoughts, and uh, we will uh, continue on with our discussant. Uh, so Raghuram Rajan is the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School and is visiting Harvard at the moment. Uh, prior to that, he was at the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 16, as well as the Vice Chairman of the Board of the Bank for International Settlements. He's been a Chief uh, Economist, Director of the Research at the International Monetary Fund, um, and again, has a, has a broad array of, uh, of uh, economics publications and banking, corporate finance, and economic development. Uh, there he is. <laughs> Uh, so we're very pleased to have you, Rev. Ram, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. How much time do I have? About 15 minutes, if that works for you. Okay. I might take a little more, but uh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> partly because I... Well, le let me start with a caveat. I didn't have a paper to look at. I also just got, uh, got the presentation, and uh, obviously, Arvind has done a terrific job of presenting it and adding color. So. Uh, I guessed at the nuances. Now we actually see the nuances as he presents it. And um, I think it's it's uh, uh, pretty obvious what the message of the paper is. India has uh, got it right on some things, such as what he calls hardware, but the software is still buggy and needs to be fixed. And without fixing the software, uh, it will be problematic to grow anywhere near what uh, India needs to grow at. Now, uh, Arvind and Josh are uh, two great uh, students of the Indian economy and have to be commended for trying to bring data to the analysis uh, of what's going on. 
And uh, I would add to that, that in these times where few dare shine a mirror on the Indian establishment, they have been more frank than most. Uh, they are, as Arvind said, uh, somewhat pessimistic, I would say indeed deeply pessimistic about India's future economic progress, despite the buoyancy of the Indian uh, stock market. And uh, central to their pessimism is today's policy regime. Arvind did a lot of, on the one hand, on the other hand, trying to downplay his criticism of the policy regime. But I, I think it came out quite clearly that he thinks we are headed in the wrong direction. Now, I agree with much of their analysis, but let me uh, try a, a, uh, to add some, uh, some flavors to it. And, and first, let me get some nitpicking out of the way. There is a temptation to start with a whole bunch of things which highlight the, the strengths of what the government has been doing, partly because there's a government that resents criticism. But, uh, but I think one should also examine some of those facts and ask what really they mean. I mean, we have a buoyant stock market, the best performing stock, stock market uh, recently. Uh, you know, how much of that is, uh, is anticipating a really, really strong economy? Some of it might be, but also we must remember stock markets across the world have been buoyant except for China. And, and Arvind pointed to the fact that in the last few months, the Indian econ, uh, stock market has done better than the others. The question you have to ask is how much reflects, uh, of this reflects uh, emerging market fund money fleeing China and coming to India. So how much of it is really uh, for the long term and how much is hot and temporarily stashed till China, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese developments become clearer what China intends to do. Also, as uh, Sajid Chinoy has, uh, has emphasized, uh, large companies have done particularly well during the pandemic, cutting labor and other costs and improving profitability. Profitability actually has risen during the pandemic. And, and therefore, it's uh, not surprising that uh, large companies which are on the stock market, uh, their valuations will show up. Uh, the question is, is this anything about economic growth in general, which also needs to include the small and medium sector, as well as, um, as the household sector? Or is this about a narrow segment, uh, large companies, but also, as Arvind pointed out, the tech companies, the unicorns, who are focused on not just the Indian market, but more broadly. Um, and, and finally, the question you have to ask is how much of this as across the world reflects very easy monetary policy and abundant liquidity finding its way into the stock market rather than really prospective growth. And, and of course, any look backwards uh, uh, suggests a cause for concern. For example, if you look at passenger cars, uh, their sales have been stagnant for about 10 years at just below 3 million. And most recently, Ford quit India. Uh, not suggestive that it has a lot of anticipation of strong growth going forward. So we have to be a little uh, sort of more uh, circumspect about those stock market numbers. Uh, unicorns, great news. I, I, I always enjoyed talking to uh, entrepreneurs in Bangalore, uh, in Hyderabad, and it's, it's great that many of them are doing, uh, doing well. The question you have to ask is, uh, is how many of them have really benefited from the Indian infrastructure? How many are incorporated in India, not in Singapore? How many are funded by Indian VCs, not by foreign VCs, and, uh, and with large dollops of money from elsewhere? Uh, I think uh, you know, this, again, is on the whole positive news. But uh, it would be nice if, uh, if, in fact, we could uh, highlight the role that India has played in their growth, as opposed to the fact that they're largely manned by Indians uh, who uh, certainly have immense capabilities. Uh, FDI, how much of FDI is greenfield investment, people opening factories to employ Indian workers, as opposed to foreign entities buying stakes in domestic firms? The difference matters. Uh, in the former case, you would create jobs and real investment. In the latter case, there's not really much in terms of, uh, of new jobs coming uh, uh, directly from this kind of investment. I think it's good news that in Air India has finally been privatized. And uh, certainly the government deserves credit for taking the plunge. Uh, but you know, this is just one drop 
in a whole need for privatization that has been flagged by this government for a long time. And uh, to my mind, it's, it's the only one that has happened. Uh, of course, nothing happened uh, after the NDA government, the previous NDA government of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, but still we need to do more. And so we shouldn't be going overboard on, on just one of these. Again, uh, due praise for having done it. Um, and, and finally, infrastructure, we see a lot of road building, but how much of the private sector involvement is there? How much of private sector funding is there? Uh, really, we need to get that back because otherwise we are entirely reliant on infrastructure built by a cash trap government. And how much more of that is there going to be as we look forward? Now, one of the things this government has done well, which uh, certainly in my large stock at Brown, I, I praised, was the new welfareism, the uh, what, what Arvind terms the new welfareism. I don't know if uh, if he coined the term or it came from elsewhere, but certainly the bank accounts, uh, the transfers such as PM Kisan, the electricity, cooking gas, toilets, all those have been rolled out in a big way. And at, at face uh, value, certainly have been, uh, you know, uh, net positive. But then during the pandemic, we saw a total breakdown in the welfare system. Uh, we saw that uh, a, a tremendous mi migration of urban workers into the rural areas where they relied on the old Norega, which had been set up by the UPA government, as well as the right to food, again, which had been set up by the UPA government. So what really has changed on the welfare? Yes, we made some transfers, but in general, I think all the evidence we have is households are really hurting during the pandemic, and a number of uh, lower and middle income households have actually slipped into dire straits and uh, food scarcity may indeed, uh, not, not grains which are plentifully supplied, but other kinds of food may in fact be an issue in, uh, in, in many households. So, so broadly, uh, I, I think one can nitpick some of the achievements, uh, but I, I, I will let them stay and, and, and move on to the broader set of concerns, uh, which is, uh, you know, to some extent, um, I think Arvind is, is uh, you know, trying to be nice to this present government, uh, blaming both the UPA and this government for the current pass of affairs. And, and it is true, the last um, um, serious reforming government on the growth side was uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee's NDA, which, which did a lot, which uh, it often did not get credit for, which showed up in the subsequent growth. Uh, both the UPA as well as the current government have focused much more on redistribution uh, and, uh, you know, in a poor country like India, that do too uh, plays a role, but you do need growth in order to create the, um, the surplus that can be redistributed. But uh, the nitpicking here that I have with Arvind is much of the decline in numbers is recent, and he, he wants to push it back to the UPA. Certainly, the last few years of the UPA government did not pr produce spectacular growth. But if you look at some of the stunting, some of the anemia and so on, that's that's more recent. Uh, uh, I think uh, it would be nice if you went back over his slides and looked at what uh, sort of dates from about 2015, 2016, and what is earlier, and it'd be useful to differentiate because I would argue that the UPA did have acts of omission. It didn't push forward the reform agenda on the growth side, focusing on the reform agenda on the distribution side. The current government, in addition to continuing that reform agenda on the distribution side, has actually had acts of commission which have reduced our growth potential. And that, to my mind, is a source of great worry. Let me, in uh, the next uh, five minutes or so, talk about this point about hardware and software that Arvind and Josh used. They're, they're nice as analogies. Uh, you know, they're good to convey points, but, but it would be nice to know precisely what they mean by hardware and software. Hardware seems to mean government programs, like the Jandhan Yojana or road building. Now, I want to distinguish that from frameworks. I think the um, Aadhaar stack that Nandan and the UPA government of uh, uh, Manmohan Singh put together, and which was taken forward by the NDA government, 
Uh, I think the Aadhaar stack is a framework. It's about how you can work with data, how you can make payments, how you can have identities on the stack. And, and clearly it has uh, been a tremendous development. So um, hardware of the Jandhan Yojana has had some effect uh, but really what has had much more effect in terms of pushing India on the growth path is frameworks, uh, frameworks like the Aadhaar stack uh, and the associated uh, sort of technologies that uh, Nandan Nelekani uh, put together under um, uh, his, uh, his, um, his term. Um, and um, I think it would be better that we have more solid frameworks. I'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, the software that uh, um, uh, Arvan seems to talk about is everything else, uh, and uh, that includes a lot. Uh, so let me redefine a little bit. Um, by hardware, I think there are two types of hardware. One is hard infrastructure, roads, ports, airports, houses, logistics. And if we are to get substantial fixed in, uh, asset uh, investment and growth from there, which China did for a long time, we need to do far more on that. There has been some progress, as Arvin shows, the pace of road construction has increased. But I think the clearest sign that we haven't done enough is you look at one of the government's signal projects. It's, uh, its pet project, the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Link. This project uh, you know, has been talked about for a long period of time. It was expected to be completed by December, 2023. Um, as I read it now, the completion date has been pushed to October, 2028. This is India's only high-speed line compared it to China, which has so much high-speed rail. We haven't the possibility of completing this one line, which is the government's favorite project uh, we don't do it till October 2028, suggests that there are difficulties in the hardware, including land acquisition, which seems to be halting this. Uh, again, I don't want to say high-speed rail is what we need next, but if it is a government project which has been given high importance, it would be nice to know that the government has been able to achieve it. It hasn't. Um, soft infrastructure, I think, is possibly more important. Uh, and this is part still of the broader hardware. So, so let me not confuse the terminology too much. But, uh, but what I mean by this is on the business side, ease of doing business, uh, the tax structure, the subsidy structure, the tariff structure, um, the administration, including how many inspectors show up at your door uh, every week or month, the court system, the bankruptcy system, uh, all this is important to getting sort of uh, uh, business going. Um, but also soft infrastructure includes capability building, uh, schools, colleges, health facilities, uh, financial institutions, uh, all these help the economy go forward. And I think the gap between what we need and what we have is increasing here. With the pandemic dealing an especially cruel blow, Arvind said I'd talk about small and medium enterprises. I don't have much time. I will just say they are in a bad way. A lot of the problems they have, you get to know when you talk to the entrepreneurs and it really needs dealing with. Uh, I don't think we have that on our radar screen as much because they're not showing up as NPAs yet. Uh, the second, uh, I think, uh, uh, sort of important issue is schooling. There are so many kids who have been out of school for a long time when they're brought back. Not only have they not progressed from where they were because, uh, you know, trying to keep up with your lessons, even if you have a smartphone is very, very difficult. But not only have you not kept up, but you've also forgotten a lot. And I think we have really the possibility of a lost generation in, uh, in, in India, unless we take tremendous efforts to offer remedial education to the kids who have been out of school, especially the poorer ones. Otherwise, we'll see them taken out of school, put, it, put at work or uh, married off uh, with uh, consequent limitations on human capital down the line. And of course, uh, a very different life, uh, a more tragic life than what they would otherwise have had. Um, so let me now finally come to software. What is software? It's a master program uh, or vision of where India is going economically, as well as an operating system which rules some commands illegal and permits legitimate ones, right? So what are we doing on that? What is India's master program or economic vision? And here Arvind was, uh, was quite uh, uh, very good at pointing out some of the contradictions. 
If we are going on export-led growth, that is, make in India is about producing for the rest of the world, um, you know, why raise tariffs? Uh, now, this term import tariff is an export tax seems may seem confusing to some of our lay audience. Basically, if I raise the price of steel in my country, I make it much harder to export cars from my country because I've just increased the price of one of their key inputs. And of course, they're competing the world market with other car producers who don't have to pay those uh, steel tariffs. So raising tariffs is effectively a way of curbing your exports at a time when our domestic demand is likely to be heavily impaired and exports are the way, is this the right way to go? Um, uh, Arvin talked about free trade agreements. I would uh, go also to how we treat uh, foreign investors. Why treat Jeff Bezos when he comes to India as a used car salesman and insult him? I mean, he is the richest man in the world and has a lot of investment power. Um, many other countries roll out the red carpet. Uh, we, we, we did not, at least uh, from what I read in the newspapers. Um, and, and if we are thinking of exports, shouldn't we be thinking of encouraging our main export, which is services? Uh, how do we create a framework for encouraging service exports? Increasingly, service exports are going to be based on data. Do we have an adequate framework for data privacy, data security, which other countries can trust? If our government doesn't enact that, no country is going to willing, be willing to let its data be held in India, which is going to limit our ability to do those kinds of service exports. We should be thinking about this if, in fact, we are thinking of export-led growth, but clearly we're not thinking uh, very much about that. Well, the alternative is domestic demand-focused growth, and India is a big country. But where is the demand going to come from? Uh, as I said, fixed asset investment is going to be hard if we don't have uh, clear land acquisition policies. Industrial investment is going to be hard because we, uh, you know, one of our slides talked about capacity utilization, which is still very low. How are we going to get investment if we don't have capacity utilization? How about our households consuming? Well, the rich can certainly consume, but the impoverishment and the scarring caused by the pandemic is going to limit consumption by the middle class and the lower middle class. Many of them don't have jobs. Many of them now have jobs, but only in agriculture. Uh, we've got a reversion back to agriculture. These are serious problems which will limit domestic demand. And of course, finally, relying on the government with debt to GDP of 90%, it's unclear how much support can be uh, given by the government, especially if the center keeps revenues to itself and doesn't share it with the rich states. The states are a big factor in infrastructure investment, and many of them are now uh, starved of funding. Now, I want to end by talking about, these are all narrow points. A vision cannot consist of a set of inconsistent government programs, and we need a broader vision which is consistent. But even with a set of consistent economic policies, a vision is not just that. It's about what we want to be as a country. And here I have to say that while the ruling establishment's economic vision is confused, it has a very clear political and social vision, which I'll come to uh, as an ending point. We, uh, the, uh, I, I want to dovetail this uh, with, uh, with, the, with the sort of operating system. We had a creaky operating system that left much to be desired, but it worked off a fashion and was improving slowly. Certainly has been improving uh, um, for, for quite some time uh, since perhaps the emergency uh, in 1975 to 77. Uh, what we find again is the creaky operating system is ineffective in checking the downsides of a determined leadership. And there are three concerning aspects of the government program which a functioning operating system would rule out of order, would rule as illegal commands, but we are seeing emerging. And Arvind touched upon some of this. I would emphasize them as authoritarianism, cronyism, and majoritarianism, and they feed on each other. Now, authoritarianism is not just the centralization of power, and we have extreme centralization, not just the central government having a lot of power, but within the central government, power in the prime minister's office and the home ministry. But it's also about the centralization of funds. Uh, more and more is going to the center as CES, which is unable, unavailable, un unavailable to the states. And, and these funds are used as a lever over states. Uh, the, the wanted fisc fiscal federalism 
is not operating as one might desire. But we also have the use of central agencies like the tax authorities, the enforcement directorate, the CBI to keep people, including critics and political opponents in line. And most recently we had, uh, you know, uh, the, the Pegasus incident where software was allegedly, and I wanna emphasize allegedly, used to keep tabs on prominent members of the opposition, including Rahul Gandhi, the um, uh, leader of Congress. Um, you know, uh, the, the problem with, uh, with the Pegasus is that uh, the organization which actually sells it claims it sells only to government. So if, if in fact these people have been kept tabs on, it has to be potentially uh, some arm of the government which has undertaken uh, this kind of spying. But if in fact that has happened, again, I want to say these haven't been established, uh, this has compromised national security because in fact you've worked with a foreign company to keep tabs on loyal Indian citizens. And that to my mind is a source of leverage for foreign entities because they can hold it over you as a threat point to try and get you to do their bidding. So broadly speaking, it seems to me this kind of authoritarianism is problematic for the economy, it's problematic, not just because it suppresses criticism, but also information that could lead to a change in the path. This is something that I've been pointed to. It is also problematic because sound, fearless advice or criticism and receptivity to both are critical to developing the right policies. If, in, if on the other hand, you have a leader surrounded by an echo chamber of sycophants with he has no ability to correct course or avoid mistaken policies because nobody is saying this is wrong, think your policy again. More generally, and this is beyond governance, uh, free speech is critical to producing ideas. And the world of the future is the world of ideas. If in fact we limit the production of ideas by tampering with them and, and damping down on critical ideas, we in fact, are damaging our future. So that's one on authoritarianism. The second aspect of the operating uh, of the program is cronyism. Arvind and Josh talk a lot about this. Um, I think they left out an important new development. Uh, they talk about the two ways. We know they're talking about Ambani and Adani, but they left out an important source of cronyism which spreads beyond the two, which is the new form of electoral funding. Uh, there is no greater encouragement to corruption and cronyism than a non-transparent means of funding which has official legitimacy. And I would argue the electoral bond scheme that we now have uh, is, is particularly dangerous in, these in this regard. For those who don't know, anyone who wants to give to a political party can do so by purchasing electoral bonds, but only the State Bank of India, a government-owned bank, knows who the donors are now. Uh, and hopefully they keep that secure, but uh, who will be brave enough, given the information that is collected by a state-owned bank, to give any funds to the opposition? What we saw was 76% of the bonds purchased in 2019-20 went to the BJP and only 9% to the main opposition party, the Congress. Now, what is unclear is that you know, there may be quid pro quos taking place between the unknown business donor and the receiving party. Uh, we don't know. The public has no ability to know. And when the proposal was first mooted, both the Election Commission and the Reserve of Bank of India expressed their concerns to no avail. Fortunately, the issue is again likely to come up before the Supreme Court. But the warning we want to emphasize here is that if we have a cronyist economy, uh, the kind of tariffs and subsidies that we are seeing emerge flourish. This was true of the license permit raj that India has. It is potentially true of what we are seeing emerging. It is hard to dismiss the possibility that cronyism is once again officially sanctioned in India. It was something we got away from with mixed, uh, you know, mixed uh, results but uh, we are going potentially back to it in a much bigger way. And that leads to the last problem and the final problem I'll stop here, majoritarianism. So, you know, um, why is the government so popular despite all the anxiety? And it is popular. The India Today Mood of Nation poll again reemphasizes 
that uh, the leadership is uh, is uh, is seen in high, um, in, you know, Prime Minister Modi is seen uh, very well by the broader public. But interestingly, what uh, the government gets credit for are uh, two achievements which uh, would not play that well outside. Uh, one is the building of uh, the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, and the second is the suspension of Article 370 in Kashmir. Um, these, um, I think, uh, you know, tell a story that so long as the government believes its majoritarianism uh, has popular support, it trumps its economic underperformance, and it has no reason to refocus on the economic underperformance. Uh, indeed, uh, there is a danger which has been there um, right through that economic difficulty may spur more crowd-pleasing majoritarianism. I personally believe it hard to imagine that India will become more nationally secure uh, given the threats on its borders or economically successful as a nation by trampling on the rights of 15 to 20% of its people. Uh, not only that, the slogan Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan not just excludes Christians, Muslims, and Parsis, but it also risks exacerbating long dormant divisions between North India and South India. Uh, as Arvind said, we are see seeing increasingly reservations for sons of the soil in different states. It is hard to dissociate this from the broader divisive agenda, which, which labels Indians as Indian this and Indian that, not all of us as Indian citizens. So let me end by saying the reality is that so long as uh, you know, the public believes the right software, the right operating system is only the concern of a small liberal elite in Leutians Delhi, in Indians elite universities and universities abroad, India is unlikely to rectify that operating system and to find robust sustained growth. So. I would uh, add to um, Arvind's pessimism by saying, I don't see a change in approach uh, which, which, which would work unless we fix that operating system. Yes, India will rebound from the disastrous economic performance last year. It's hard not to, uh, because the performance was truly terrible given where we were. But India's true salvation lies in a total reboot of its current path. And that requires a total change in national mood, call it software, call it hardware, but that to my mind is what we need. Let me stop there. Uh, uh, Avin, did you wanna say a few words or shall we just open up to Q&A? Uh, let's, let's open it open up to Q&A and uh, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, I just wanna say that I, I thought I was giving an economic talk. I was not in a political science forum, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we'll come to that. All right. Uh, Arvind, Arvind, just one thing. Uh, I, I think when you talk about software, you're sort of verging on the broader environment in which economics works. And you cannot totally dissociate the two. The two are totally linked, as you well know. No, no, that, that's why, uh, uh, Raghu, you know, I, um, when I talk about the, the need for social harmony and the broader political software as well, which you were much, you were much more uh, uh, kind of hard on and elaborated on. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, to, to that extent, I think uh, the political software uh, is important, uh, uh, and no denying that. Uh, but I think even uh, before uh, you get there, I think there's a lot of stuff even on the, just the business or the frameworks, the bugs in the economic policy framework that kind of needed to be fixed. And I gave several examples of that, you know, the inconsistency, the favoritism, the rule of law, the lack of, you know, uh, independent institutions. And of course, all of them have uh, political, uh, uh, you know, both origins and causes and ramifications, which you, of course, very eloquently uh, elaborated on. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, so uh, you want to start off? Please use a microphone because we want to make sure it goes over the YouTube. Uh, uh, that requires it. Is it off? Yeah, Rishi, you're the one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this yeah, is Yeah, five. Uh, first of all, as an organizer of this event, I'm truly grateful to the two mighty intellects that we saw in evidence. 
over the last 90 minutes or so. Uh, both Raghu and Arvind are not just policy economists, as they have been, but they are truly, truly mighty intellects, and we saw that. I have only one question that I want either of them or both of them to reflect on. Just one question, which is the majoritarianism argument point that Raghu made. If India's, if the current regime in India, supported by 60-65% of the Hindu community, which is 80% of India, um, makes the current regime feel that it can beat up on Muslims, it can deny them equality, it can put them in jail, it can kill them with abandon, it can lynch them, and no lynchers will be, will be, uh, will be put, to, uh, put to justice. What uh, I understand is the political scientists what will do to, do to politics. I want to know from both Raghu and Arvind, what will it do to the economics of the country? The, the virulent, violent majoritarianism or anti-Muslim turn in Indian politics over the last few years, what will it do to the economics of the country? Arvind, do you want to start? Uh, I think, uh, Raghu, you've already answered that question, right? <laughs> uh, to some extent, or you want to add more? No, uh, look, I, uh, I'm very worried. Uh, I'm very worried because, um, I mean, divisions, uh, I, th I think underlying this agenda is, is somehow we unite the Hindus uh, against, um, you know, the rest, and that will be a unifying factor for India. I think my worry is it creates even more divisions. Uh, and... Uh, so, so one is that, that, uh, that the divisive agenda doesn't unite, it creates even more divisions. The, the second uh, worry I have is any action breeds reaction. Um, I mean, um, you know, suppression and repression uh, brings, uh, you know, uh, uh, a reaction from the community being suppressed and repressed. I would, I mean, um, uh, I would hope that uh, we don't escalate to violence, but we are seeing some very troubling signs, for example, in Kashmir, uh, which, uh, which uh, again, I, I do hope uh, do not reflect a, a, a broader concern. Um, so I, I just think that, um, you know, an agenda which keeps out a significant part of your population cannot be growth positive. You want everybody to join in, but it also cannot be growth positive from the external side. I mean, remember that we are trying to make nice with the democracies of the world. Take the Quad. That's, uh, that's uh, an example of us trying to uh, walk with the democracies. If uh, the New York Times and the Financial Times and the Economist keep reporting some of what's going on within the country uh, in terms of majoritarian behavior, it doesn't endear us to the intellectuals, to the uh, to the policymakers in those countries, and, and certainly makes the kind of dialogue as well as the kind of uh, engagement we want in order to protect ourselves against some of our neighbors. It makes it much harder. So, so I think from the political side, from the uh, security side, and ultimately from the economic side, uh, these are bad policies. So, so I think uh, Ashu's question was much more. Uh, what is uh, the impact of majoritarianism on economics, yeah. no, on politics and external? You know, it's all. Uh, I, think we would, I would agree with. Yeah, you, you'd agree. Saying, yeah. But on economics. Yeah, on, on the economics. I, I think that, look, we know that uh, from uh, all the history of long-run economic development, that uh, instability. Uh, political instability, social instability, social conflict are, you know, uh, Andrew and others have written about this, uh, long run, absolutely bad for economic development, right? No question about it. Um, so, uh, and uh, therefore, I can unambiguously say that any majoritarian agenda, any divisive agenda is long run really bad for economic development, and it works in many ways, right? We know it can work via the allocation of public goods. 
it, it can uh, work by you know, just deterring investment because there's too much instability. Uh, so uh, unambiguously bad for long-run economic development. Um, I think that the issue here for me, which I don't have a good sense of, is uh, what is the time horizon in which that actually starts kicking in? You know, short run, can I say with any confidence that, you know, this majoritarianism is going to extract economic costs, you know, in the, today, in, in the next year, in the next three years? I don't know. So the timing of that is going to be uh, very difficult to say. But uh, in the long run, it's com absolutely uh, 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 unambiguous. And also because, you see, in this, the other factor is that uh, you know, there's a lot of unintended consequence uh, and, and uh, backlash that can happen. I mean, um, for a long time, I, I used to think that you know, all these, you know, in the aftermath of the CAA, there was a lot of violent protest, a lot of conflict. Um, I thought at that stage, actually, foreign investors kind of would get deterred and not invest and so on. But in a sense, it's the classic thing, right? Uh, uh, regimes can uh, tamp down on this uh, for a sufficiently long period of time. And, uh, but we know eventually, uh, uh, you know, the lid will blow off. I just don't have any good sense of what the timing of the lid blowing off will be. Can I just follow up on, uh, sure. just very short, and, uh, Arushi, one. Uh, Raghu, Raghu hinted at something interesting. And I think, uh, Arvind, you've talked about it in some of your seminars, uh, in, uh, one at Harvard, I remember. Um, one connection between that kind of politics and economics could be that if I can win an election, or if I can win elections after elections by whipping majoritarianism, then I don't have to worry about economic performance. Well, you see, I think that uh, um, A, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I hope you don't believe that's true in, in the long run. In the long run, yeah. yeah. Huh? yeah I'm, I'm yeah. I think all of us believe demonetization was devastating for, for a large section of the population. But soon after demonetization, the UP elections took place and the BJP government won even bigger. So, 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 yeah. uh, so, but I think, see, and this is um, an argument we had uh, uh, when Raghu came here last time as well. See, I think that reading of Indian politics today is a little bit one-sided because, as I emphasized and, and Raghu agreed, that the new welfareism, you know, is, uh, uh, is not majoritarianism, is, is orthogonal, distinct from, and very positive because, you know, uh, if you can improve the lives of the poor by providing, you know, uh, cooking gas, uh, housing, or toilets, now water into people's houses, which, by the way, have disproportional uh, impact on women, for example, right? Uh, and you can give cash. Uh, then the question becomes not is uh, majoritarian uh, Economic uh, politics bad for uh, uh, economics, but if you do majoritarian uh, uh, politics, and if you also believe in this new welfareism, then can you will you have the resources to be able to do this for long enough? And that's why the growth agenda uh, then becomes important. And then you know what is the impact of majoritarian economics and all the other things that the government is doing on, 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 on the growth agenda uh, then become uh, a very important. So that's the way I would see it, that you know, uh, there is a long run effect which comes from social harmony, social peace, the lack of conflict. Uh, uh, in the short run, my reading is not that, oh, because they have done majoritarian, they've ignored the economic dimension. I think the new welfareism is a huge part of uh, the, the popular. By the way, th there's, a, there's one very interesting question that, I mean, I've thought about, and, and Devish and I have thought about, is that I would like to see some research done on, has majoritarian politics actually also translated into majoritarian allocation of the new welfareism. Do we have evidence? And so far, I don't think we have any evidence uh, that that's been. So, so in that sense, 
uh, as far as we know, majoritarian uh, politics has not seemed into the delivery of these uh, essential goods and services. So, so that's an interesting kind of uh, question uh, uh, and an open question as well. So I think it's kind of, uh, you know, but, you know, I, I don't want, I, I'm not an expert on politics for politics, uh, in, in, in qua politics, uh, but, you know, how can you not uh, agree with all that you said and all that Raghu have said that, you know, in pure politics, but it's just this interaction between politics and economics, uh, I think, is much more uh, uh, complicated than, than we're letting on. Arushi. Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Arushi. I'm a PhD student in economics at Brown. I, I think you're cutting the government too much slack by saying that we don't know what's happening in the short run because to your last comment, uh, there is a research by a PhD student at, uh, in economics at IIM Ahmedabad that did say uh, that in places that BJP is in power, there seems to be greater allocation uh, of public goods being made to upper caste Hindus. And that PhD dissertation was blocked from pub being published and the, and the PhD of this uh, researcher was under question that there, there was immense pressure and the director of the of IIM Ahmedabad stood up uh, to that pressure that's one number two is that uh, we actually know what's happening in the short run because we have lots of research from for instance Sam Asher Paul Novosad and Kalai over who's a postdoc at Brown here uh, which is showing that Muslims on aggregate seem to be doing much worse both in terms of income and in terms of education. So what we know is that intergenerational mobility of one social group is falling in India, and that is Muslims. Uh, the last point that I wanted to, I, have, I actually have lots of questions, but <laughs> I think the last one that I will end that is the one you said about us as the Indian economists not having much to say about politics, your immediate successor in the office of the chief economic advisor, who by the way resigned this morning, um, oh, did. Okay. he did, <laughs> uh, made a statement on Kashmir which was totally unrequited and he said that the day uh, on 5th August 2019 said that Saraswati has now taken her rightful seat in the head of India. Um, I think as, as, in, as a community of Indian economists at some point, we will have to take more responsibility and have something to say about these things as well. Thank you. Yeah. No, no. Uh, okay, okay. So, 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 uh, yeah. So, so, so yeah. Uh, Raghu has a lot to answer for on this one. <laughs> so, so, uh, 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 so, Raghu's student has resigned as chief economic advisor. Raghu. Uh, so, so uh, on your on your three points, I, I, I think uh, uh, you, you would be the first to say that. Uh, uh, you know, um, generally those kinds of incursions into politics are, are, are not to be uh, uh, desired, and I'm sure we, we, we'd agree on that. On your two points, see, I think you, you have to be a bit careful here. Uh, on the first point, you know, uh, the, the, your, I've heard about, I've not seen the, the thesis itself, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's, it was more this upper caste thing yes. versus, right? A a and uh, you know, you know, um, that still doesn't speak to the majoritarian, uh, you know, the religious divide. Uh, a a and uh, remember that I find that uh, uh, you know, again, um, uh, one has to. I, I don't know this well enough, but uh, you, we, we know that uh, part of the, uh, the and, and Ashu knows this better. Part of the kind of ideological framing of uh, Hindutva is that you know you want to actually not do these uh, intra-Hindu divisive stuff in order to you know, uh, play the majoritarian minoritarian card. So it still doesn't quite speak to that uh, issue, uh, um, uh, although uh, because I, I think the, the whole OBC thing uh, and stuff become very important. On the second your thing, I think you're being a little bit uh, 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 unfair because all the Sam Asher, et cetera, view is about long run mobility. No, how much of maybe it's got aggravated in the sh in, by this government? We don't know. I, I don't know the, the data. But to say that that is due to this government, I don't think is my reading of Sam Asher and things. These are much more, much longer trends. You know. Uh, so, for example, I'll, sh I'll tell you in terms of educational attainment. It's in my paper with with Rohit Lamba uh, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. It is true that if you see educational attainment. Uh, Hindu upper castes are converging to uh, the global frontier. Mm -hmm. The OBCs have narrowed the initial gap with things. For the uh, uh, scheduled uh, castes, uh, it's kind of a little bit of narrowing. 
but the scheduled tribes outside the Northeast and the, the Muslims have gotten, you know, the, the, uh, there's been no convergence at all. But that's a long run phenomenon. It's been happening for the last uh, 30 years. So I'd love to see data which says that, you know, this has actually gotten aggravated, you know, in the last four or five years. And, and you know, to, to some extent, uh, I, um, I do want at some stage, uh, or, or in all that I, the way I view the world, is to think at it as much from a kind of country point of view and you know what we should be doing differently, rather than getting into you know these partisan things about you know which government did worse and which government did better. And I think we have to call out all governments for what they do right and what they do wrong. Uh, uh, but I think equally, I want to be a, a bit careful that it doesn't degenerate into a kind of you know partisan. You know, UPA did this and BJP did this. As I said, there's continuity, good and bad. Uh, there's disruption, good and bad. A and we should you know, call out uh, all of these. But there's been also been a lot of continuity. There's also been, a, uh, I mean, and one of the points that uh, Raghu said is actually there's been a lot of discontinuity uh, going from good to bad, which is the, the basic reforms uh, started under Vajpayee and uh, not a whole lot of you know, market-based reforms took place. Similarly, I think uh, in terms of the whole uh, social welfare network, I think that um, the Mandrega and the PDS, and I, I want to be completely honest here that you know when uh, UPA uh, two did Mandrega and PDS, some of us, I think, uh, including Raghu and me, were somewhat skeptical of that, and I, I think we should be honest about that and say you know we were actually wrong on that. And uh, but equally, I think you know uh, uh, Raghu said you know all the stack etc. got uh, cre uh, conceived under uh, UPA two. Absolutely right. But equally, I think uh, we know, and this is why I don't like getting into this UPA, BJP stuff, because it's equally true that had UPA2 continued, the whole uh, stack, Aadhaar, you know, uh, accounts all would have kind of stalled in terms of the progress. So, so to me, it's not, a, you know, uh, getting into this partisan thing is, uh, let's, let's think about what we need to change, you know what is the software that's gone bad, uh, both on the political side, on the economic side, uh, and uh, let's you know this uh, a partisan assigning of blame. I think is something that is good for the academic thing, but uh, I, I do want to uh, be constructive going forward. So, so Arvind, let me just add uh, a little bit on that. I I, I agree broadly with you that uh, this this point about assigning blame, which uh, I. I uh, I think partly uh, stems from, uh, you know, uh, um, a government wanting to soak up all the credit for what's good and, and assigning blame for what's bad to the previous government. That's natural for every government. That's no, no, not, uh, uh, and, and it's true of this one also. But I, I, I keep wanting to take you back to, you cannot talk about the economics without thinking about the broader structure in which it takes place. And, and that's why I like your software. If I, if I think you think about the broader structure, but that means everything that people in this room are worried about. And, and you know, trying to think that there'll be a change in the economics uh, without uh, all that being taken care of is, uh, is problematic. For example, you talked about tariffs. Why are we seeing these tariffs increase? Well because we are back to a certain amount of cronyism, which used to take place in the license permit raj. But what, what do people want cronyism uh, for? Why, why is that, that happening in a sense? Because the government is willing to essentially favor a few in order to get support from them. It doesn't need many more after that. And uh, you know, so you can't sort of dissociate that from the structure of governance. So, 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 Raghu, I, I think that, look, and, and <laughs> I mean, this is not about chables. This is not about creating a whole bunch of it. It's creating about very few favored entities. See, I, 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 I think, um, uh, 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 Raghu, I spent a lot of time on stigmatized capitalism at great risk, uh, 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 calling it the two, two A variant, and we know. But I, I do think that. I honestly think that uh, the return to protectionism and industrial policy may have some cronyist element, but I think there's a kind of uh, independent, 
ideological basis for that as well. I think there is a view that, you know, uh, we need to have uh, uh, import substitution because, you know, others did it, we can also do it. So the, uh, I think to reduce it all to cronyism, that I, uh, I do not agree with. I think, you know, uh, there's also a kind of a, a kind of ideological view on protectionism and, and import substitution. Uh, Raghu, I, 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 let I, I, look, no, I, no, I will agree with that. Yeah, no, no, listen, yeah. let me finish. And the view, and the view that you have sometimes embraced as well, that, you know, India is a big market and therefore we can do import substitution to, as, as a way of generating growth. The, the government and the prime minister strongly believe that there's a big domestic market. He keeps saying the three Ds are, you know, democracy, demography, and demand. And, and so, 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 uh, you and I have serious uh, disagreements with this policy, but I, let's not all reduce it to, oh, it's because of cronyism, because there's a completely, you know, other bad reasons for bad policy as well. Okay, no, I, 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 uh, uh, Arvind, uh, just, can we just get a on... question from the audience since we're, we're, we only have about 10 minutes left? Yeah, you. okay. Uh, thank you for the engaging talk. Um, you, I have a, you want to switch on the mic? Hello. Yeah, okay. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's working, sir. This, this is, this is more on and off. Thank more you. On and off. Thank you. <laughs> no, on the Muslim question, actually, there's a clear evidence. I calculated in, for this in the uh, in paper. Say from if you calculate from 68th round 11, 12 to PLFS 18, 19, you clearly see the educational attainment convergence between SCs. OBCs and upper caste. There's clearly, this is a long trend. It's happening. One can attribute partly to the Mandel and low caste mobilization broad sense. But definitely there is a widening of the Muslim, Muslim getting dropped out. Whether that is actually because of the inbuilt mechanism is rooted in the longer run or if something is happening between, say, 2014 onwards, is it's open to the question. But evidence suggests that, say, some of the universities are not recognizing Madrasa degree, for instance. This is a recent thing is happening which would have a potential impact on getting into higher education, particularly on this component, which is a substantial component of the mother circuit not getting recognized. Still, we don't know. But fact reminds that there is a widening effect of Muslims. This is... Well, can we have a question? Do you have a question? question yeah. yeah. So the, the question is, I, mean, I have two questions. Just summarize it, and maybe you can take later. The new welfareism, we know, for instance, from, say, 2014, 2004 to 2011, 12, which is called as a golden period of growth and distribution, absolute decline in the poverty and the relative decline. We know the first time in the Indian history that there's a substantial lift of the poverty, which actually attributed directly to the PDS and the NRGA. So now we are not sure how much this new welfareism is at the expense of the old. Is there any net transfer or net increase as compared to the old? Is that repackaging the old to the new? Then the second question, we all know that the, the, the impact of demonetization and uh, in other policies, particularly on the small businesses. There is a concern, if you look at the numbers from, say, economic census from 2005 to 2014, substantial increase of the small firm, particularly medium scale firms in the subnational, say, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, or many other states, which definitely increased. But there is a feeling now those firms are shrinking. It's because of the political connection, you need to have a of the centralized yeah. attitude, which has an implication for the federalism. The third would be of your any views question, on the, sorry? Give me the question, please. Yeah, third. We don't, we're getting a speech. Oh, thank you, sorry. A third question is the ref, the form loss. Do you have any say in that is, with respect to the procedure? There, there, is a, there is a consensus, it's a wrong with the procedure in terms of the three form loss that the central government, is there any, difference in the substantial terms. It's just a procedural problem with the form loss. Do you see the substantially, do you disagree with the, the form loss that the government Thank you. Get more questions? Uh, okay. Sure. Is there any other questions? Or, yeah, go ahead. In the back, behind you. Um, yeah, thank you both. Actually, this has been super engaging because there's been this back and forth. Um, and I, I, my question is about pushing a little bit more on this hardware software view of really what is economic 
not just policy but ideology and the way, and, and institutional thinking uh, behind uh, economic policy in India at the moment. And so, I mean, just I, you know, a comment also from you on. I mean, if you look at this discrediting of the doing biz, doing business rankings, which really exposed, um, you know, what is the ideological sort of basis of these rankings to start with, and the manipulation of, um, you know, India's rise in the do, ease of doing business um, charts, and particularly under Modi. Um, and if I was to turn that view to domestic, to sort of domestically, how how various state governments are perhaps ranked on the, on the same accounts, um, you know, and so a little bit on turning the gaze to the subnational story as well. Uh, and the second is sort of what are the influences and how does the software speak to the hardware issues uh, within institutions that both of you have been a part of, the RBI and the Chief Economic Advisor's office, how much of the conversation there um, has a software thinking? And if you could maybe share a little bit of that with this audience. Good, good question. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the internet, that, Arishi, that you wanted to raise? Um, yes. Sorry. Arishi, she said she has a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we should, we should, think we should channel other questions and you ask take your Take the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe five from me. Uh, um, so just, just, just one or two. <laughs> okay. Uh, from the internet, uh, we have uh, more questions about uh, if you could shed light on when you're uh, talking about growth trends, if you could shed light on poverty trends in India. Yeah. Um, and then there is a question about uh, the impact of exchange rates on exports. Okay. Okay. If you could start with that and then. Okay. Um, um, let, 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 let me. Um, so, so the question on growth trends and pro poverty is also related to your first question. Um, um, my reading of the uh, e evidence is that fastest poverty reduction in India took place uh, 2002-03 to 2011. And my reading of that is that uh, it happened because of two or three reasons, uh, in which Mandrega and PDS were actually less important. Uh, 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 the, uh, the reason it happened was because we had gangbusters growth. And it was very employment intensive growth in, in three senses. So first we had rapid growth. So therefore the you know, growth has a, a huge impact on poverty. But the growth elasticity, the poverty elasticity of growth also was high because it was a period when global agriculture did very well. Uh, you know, prices went up. And then, of course, you also had Mandrega, but that was a more of a, a effect than a cause. Global prices went up. Uh, India's exports of agricultural commodities across the board boomed. Farm employment boomed. Uh, 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 that happened. Second, because that you know investment just took off, and infrastructure investment took off, you also had construction booming in that uh, 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 time. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, construction is very employment intensive. So it's the combination of the growth and the pattern of growth uh, as much as, you know, Mandrega, remember, Mandrega is a safety net. It only protects really the downside. It's not the, creating the, the surge, uh, as it were. Now, but, but extrapolate that forward. Between 2011 and 2012, and you know, all of you are, you know, uh, including Raghu, is you know saying that I'm being soft on this government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm the one who incurred all the wrath by saying that the GDP numbers are all <laughs> completely, you know, uh, overstated in India. So, so um, if you look at after 2011-12, there is no question that you know growth collapsed. One, and. I, I think the, the 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 cumulative effect of the GST and which was uh, I still continue a very good reform. It can still be retrieved, uh, and demonetization had of course uh, so weak growth. Uh, uh, you know some, these disruptions on uh, um, uh, on on the small and medium enterprises meant that uh, in that period. My calculation of 2011 to 18 is that basically I think uh, uh, poverty was, you know, either flat or a very small reduction. But of course, with COVID, uh, there's been a, a, a big increase in, in poverty again. Um, uh, how temporary or permanent? We, we'll have to wait, uh, wait and see. Um, on on, I mean, exchange rates and, and, and exports, you know, uh, 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 I, th I think Raghu and I uh, uh, 
may have different views on this. I mean, I have always felt that uh, the exchange rate is an absolutely critical uh, uh, element of, you know, having a competitive exchange rate, uh, you know, all else equal. I mean, we can talk about all the other things. H having a competitive exchange rate is critical for labor intensive exports. I've spoken to lots of garment manufacturers in India because when I was in government, I was in charge of putting together a package. I was involved in putting together a package for uh, the clothing and textile and garment, clothing and garment sector. And all of them said, our margins are so wafer thin that uh, the exchange rate, uh, a competitive exchange rate, uh, is uh, actually very important. But I think that uh, <laughs> the, the, the macroeconomic, I think, problem is, is the following. You know, if you have underlying productivity growth which is soaring, then, of course, I think, uh, you know, the exchange rate matters less. But uh, it, where these margins are thin, where, you know, you're struggling for productivity growth, you want a competitive exchange rate. But then if you are going to have an open capital account and have all this foreign money coming in, it's going to uh, uh, limit your ability uh, to use. I mean, I, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, China was able to, uh, to maintain its export boom because it had a relatively close capital account uh, for a very long time. Now, on the, uh, the question about um, uh, the, the, the institutional ranking and the subnational, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I think the, uh, 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 India does its own version, many versions of the subnational ranking. And I, I, I'm kind of very ambivalent about these, uh, these rankings. For A, for reasons that we're seeing, they, they're kind of getting, uh, either they can be explicitly manipulated or people just game the system in order to do well on these rankings and enact reforms that are not fundamentally important, uh, but you know, just because you, then you go up, uh, I think that. I, I, but I do think that within India, if we can uh, you know, maintain the integrity of some of these things, I, I think, a powerful dynamic, which which I think was in operation in India, which especially during the boom period, was competitive federalism. That you know some states do well, and other states try and and, and you know uh, emulate what they do, uh, and so this kind of you know uh, competitive federalism was, I think, a, 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 a very a very important uh, part of it. Um, uh, and, and so I, I think, therefore, there is some role for some of these kinds of things. On software in, in places where I worked, I mean, uh, look, I, I, I say software, hardware, because I deeply, deeply believe in, in software, both economic and political. I mean, you know, just to give you a, a, a very concrete example, you know, the fact that the GDP data were overstated uh, in some cases for you know, non-political technical reasons, had a huge impact on, you know, I feel on some of the policies that were implemented uh, you know, while I was there. I think the urgency for reform, uh, s some of the you know, uh, uh, fiscal policy choices that were made were influenced by bad data. Uh, and it's just a very stark example of you know having a good data, a soft, good software, and of course the other things like trust and openness and all of these things. I mean, you can you feel it on a day-to-day -day level. If if you have the trust, you know you're going to have. Uh, if you if you if you have independence and you say what you feel, I think in the long run that's actually very good for you know the boss who's asking for your advice, uh, and 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 so what Raghu said about you know having a culture that encourages dissident voices, I mean, I completely believe that. And, and, and to the extent that it's gone missing is a big problem. Raghu, did you want to add anything to those uh, questions? Um, nothing, no. Okay. I, 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 Arvind, you said, sorry, you said there was a difference between us on, uh, on exchange rates. No, I, I have no difference. I just think it's very hard to manage the exchange rate given the kind of economy we have. I mean, the RBI has increased its reserves to 640 uh, billion, but uh, you know there are still questions about the level of the exchange rate. Uh, no, I just meant uh, Raghu, the, the 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 you know our op the view on the how open the capital account should be. 
I think that's where I thought maybe you and I were not always on the same page. But uh, but if we are great, uh, <laughs> does Raghu believe that the capital account should have been open, not just the current account? No, we were taking steady measures to open it, but yeah. uh, the idea was our institutional progress would match the opening, I see. so that uh, you know eventually when it was a fully open capital account, mm -hmm. we'd also have uh, you know strong institutions and. The two feed on each other, so you can't right. wait till your institutions get better in order to open, but you shouldn't open when your institutions will likely underperform. Right. That was also the point that Bhagwati made in the famous essay, The Capital Myth in Foreign <laughs> Affairs. That was exactly the point he made. All right. Any other questions from the uh, floor here? Um, all right. Well, I think we've pretty much come to our uh, close, and uh, I want to thank uh, our speaker and our discussant. Um, uh, perhaps we could all sit and just listen to you guys chat for another couple of hours, but uh, I think we have other things on the agenda, and so uh, please uh, join me in thanking this. Raghu, we have to fix our next tennis game. <laughs> 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 <laughs>